Hi, I'm Brian. Welcome to Autogafool. Here's a question for you. If you had a car with two electric engines producing 680 horsepower and doing 0 to 100 in around about 2.3 seconds, what would it be and where would you take it? Well, that car would be the Volkswagen IDR Pikes Peak, and where I would take it is the Goodwood Festival of Speed. So, for those of you who haven't been to the Goodwood Festival of Speed before, the best way I can think of to describe it is it's kind of like a processional. Yes, hill starts the name of the game, that's what everybody is here to do, but as any one of the racing drivers will tell you, the rules are a little bit looser than you might expect from a regular track meeting, and there's a very good reason for that. Any car you can think of that you've ever imagined wanting to see that's raced at any period of history pretty much is here with somebody to drive it, and in many cases with the original driver that the car made famous. It's spectacular. But in order to accommodate that extraordinary diversity of vehicle and class, clearly you're going to have to make some compromises. And what that means is... In order to add to the theatre, for example, if you win a qualifying session, that means when it comes to the race itself, you will go last. They don't clean the track after every run, and because there's a lot of grass and a lot of stone to throw up at various points in the course as the cars try and take shortcut to get the fastest possible time, it means that the cars later on suffer a little bit in terms of time. But, to be honest with you, it really isn't about the fastest time at Goodwood. It's about seeing the most spectacular cars you always wanted to look at. Really doing the thing that they love to do best, and that's driving fast. So why are we here? Well, obviously as car nuts, there is more than a little bit for us to see and do. But the main reason we're here, you may or may not be aware of, Volkswagen recently claimed the fastest ever time on the Pikes Peak hill climb. And they did that with their brand new completely electric IDR. It's such an amazing car. And they weren't sure they were going to be able to bring it here. But after their success, they really wanted for as many people to see it as possible. So they've brought it here to Goodwood. Now, they've been very keen to point out to us that the setup isn't ideal. This is the backup car, not the main one. This is not configured perfectly for the driver, Romain Dumas. This is configured for the second driver. And of course, the track is a little less than ideal. If your car is configured for the massive downforce you need to take on Pikes Peak, you're not really going to be needing that at Goodwood. But even so, it's going to be pretty exciting to see what the car deliver. And just between us, there are some rumors that it just might be smashing some records. So this is one of the most popular golfs that's ever been built, but clearly a lot of moderations have had to take place in order to make this suitable for the Pikes Peak Challenge. I think the first thing that you really get a sense of when you address the front of this car is quite how rigid the design is. Now, we'll be familiar from looking at the newer version, I say the newer version, the newer hill climbing champion that weight is everything. Weight was very important in the design of the cars back then too, but the fact is they didn't have the high-tech materials in order to make them as structurally strong as they needed without that compromise. So we still have a lot of rivets happening here. In many ways, there's a lot more in common with the design of this car with an aircraft than there would have been with traditional automobile design at the time. Those two engines produce so much power that it's important that the car doesn't quite literally tear itself to pieces while it's going about its job of that hill climb. As we come slightly further back, the Golf assumes a bit more of its expected shape. And it's more than a little bit appealing when you can see so many of the features that you recognize from the production model car itself. But I've always liked this feature. You don't need a proper wind-down window. Come on. That's, that's not for you. Not if you actually want to do some serious driving. Window open, window shut. That works for me. 
look at these vents back here. Now, you may or may not be familiar, but one of the problems that comes with high altitude driving is that you get a lot more downforce issues than you have lower down, lower altitudes. And what that means is it's imperative to make sure that your engines are getting the air intake they need. So you have to make compromises all over the place in order to make sure the airflow is as high as it can be. So have a look at this. We have airflow access not only on the side of the car, but also specially built on the top. And just take a look at that in the back. So now we really get to have a look at the heart of the beast. Well, the first thing that you may be able to pick up on camera is that this rear shell is all fiberglass. There's clearly a good reason for that. First of all, the weight, clearly, but also there is nothing standard about this design. So everything had to be built specifically for this car. Just look at that. That is not something that you're going to be seeing on too many vehicles. Four cylinders, power going directly to that rear axle, and you can imagine that the impact that has on the drive. Look at the amount of cooling we have going on here. You're used to looking at a traditional radiator in a car. Well, how about this? Let's have two of them right at the back, getting the maximum amount of air possible to make that engine work as efficiently as it possibly can. Well, I think you get a sense of just how far engineering has come along in a relatively short amount of time when we compare this to the newer fully electric version. But I have to tell you, my heart sits with this car. I mean, just take a look at that. There's still a little bit of me that thinks, yeah, maybe I could build that in my garage. I know I couldn't really, but I can still dream. Well, this is a real treat. I didn't know if I was actually gonna be able to have the opportunity to sit here and experience quite what it would have been like in 1987. Now, I think it's worth pointing out that for me, one of the most exciting things about these hill climb events is that we're so much kept away from the technology in modern vehicles. We have such a sense of security and safety when we sit in our cars that we forget quite what an extraordinary thing it is we're doing when we drive. Well, you certainly can't sit in this car and keep that illusion. I'm so aware of the power both in front of me and back there as well. And if you listen to these cars driving around, you're under no illusion of quite how dangerous motorsport can be. Obviously, we have a much more stripped down cockpit than you would traditionally expect in a car. But everything about this experience is exciting. I would absolutely love to be able to take this car out onto the track, but somehow I don't think they're going to let me. What do you think, Michelle? Is it worth a try? Michelle's shaking his head. Maybe not today, but maybe someday. Who knows? We've been lucky enough to be joined by Yoki Kleitz. And if you're not familiar, that is 1987 and where this all started with the Golf 2. Not just any Golf 2, this is a little bit special. Yoki, could you talk to us a little bit about what you did with this car to make it take on Pikes Peak? Mm, yeah, we, we, we test a lot uh, before we go to Pikes Peak and this is the, the 87 model here and we have uh, 650 horsepower, two engines and uh, actually it's a V8 <laughs> and uh, the weight for the car is 1040 kilos, kilos. And uh, the top speed depends depends uh, on the on the on the bearings you have the can go from 180 to to 240, yeah. And uh, the capacity is 1800 uh, engines, uh, 16 valve, uh, turbocharged. So for those of you uh, who are not familiar with this car. Obviously, Golf 2 has a lot of fans worldwide, but traditionally it comes with one engine. Here <laughs> you've gone with two. Now, is the, the reason for that, the front and back distribution, to do with weight distribution? It's act actually then a four-wheel driven car. You have two engines, one in the front, one in the rear. And that means you need the traction. We drove on gravel, on gravel the, the, whole, the whole time, for the start onto the finish line. And that would make sense. And a lot of you need a lot of power because you don't have don't have the altitude. You have 40% less power on the top. I think a lot of people forget just quite how much risk there was involved in doing this back then. As you say, you have completely gravel roads. You have unknown territory. Be honest with me. Was it frightening? 
Oh, a little bit frightening, man. Uh, you have to be concentrated, o always in motorsport, of course, man. Uh, Pike Peak, particular, because, you know, it's quite deep, you know, when you fall off, yeah. Well, I think that's putting it mildly. Now, um, obviously, with petrol engines, we have a problem as we rise in altitude with the way in which the engine gets the oxygen it needs, and not only that, but also the downforce is significantly less. What did you do in order to be able to get the car to deal with that? You see, uh, now starts actually a new generation, and that means with the e-car, yeah, you can't you can't top it with a with a with a standard engine or with with a turbocharged engine. You know, uh, the e-cars. This is this is the future, uh, particular on on Pike's Peak. Yeah, even in in motorsport, and we will see how 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 it works. Yeah, for the future. Yeah, maybe we have another other concepts. You know, you never know. But let's be honest, come on, which is the better car? Which one do you want to drive? This this one or the new one? Mm. In the moment, this one, because I'm used to this, you know, I'm 70 years old, and to drive the IDR, it's it's a different story, it's a different story. I like to drive it once, yeah, maybe I have the possibility somewhere on the straight line. <laughs> and uh, you see the difference, and when you see the both cars, it next, next, uh, uh, it's 30 years, 31 years, it's a lot. That's really absolutely correct. Now, uh, what I would love to do, a lot of people are not familiar with quite how extensive the changes have to be between this car and a standard road production model. Would you be able to show us a little bit inside as to how this car specifically is set up to do those hill climbs at yeah. such great speed? Yeah, no problem. I open the door for you and you see come around here uh, the main switch yeah for the electric of course yeah then you you pull this button yeah the ignition and uh, you start the first engine here then the petrol pumps of course and you start engine two yeah and then you see the turbocharged uh, manometers here yeah all both engine is working yeah and you can drive separate as well you know you can drive with the front one with the rear one and may make no sense you need the power for pike speak yeah and uh, yeah and the gearbox the five five speed gearbox yeah yeah and the car is running uh, top speed 200 you know and that was enough on on gravel in, in the old days on the old days and uh, you have the, the racing racing gearbox in here yeah? and two powerful engines. What a, what a thrill. And no infotainment system. I can't even see where you're going to fit your 8-track uh, cassette, I think, back, yeah. back in the day. But I go in the car now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, everything is normal. You have an accelerated paddle, you have the brake paddle and the clutch paddle. Yeah? And both engine, yeah, with ropes. You get both engine, yeah, declutch it, yeah. And a lot of things what I did is, of course, yeah, I drove Volkswagen before with the front wheel driven car, World Championship, German Championship, with the Golf, Golf 2, Golf, Golf 3, and left foot braking, yeah. It's very necessary, very necessary because I don't want to have the car to be under steering. Under steering means the car is skidding over the front wheel, over steering. I need it, I need it because on the tidy corners, yeah, I break a little bit and then a little bit like in the rally style, you know, and straight again. And what I did on Pikes Peak, really, really smooth, drive like on the, like Le Mans, you know, like on the, on the motorways, on the nice apex, you know, you find everything and go smooth, no sideways, cost time. So very, very efficient driving. Now, you were so close, so close to that record and then heartbreak, so close to the end. Can you tell us what happened? Yeah, you're right, yeah. Never, never everybody except the car was a little bit uh, unibal, uh, belt, yeah, cost uh, maybe yeah, two pounds, you know, in the shop. And that was a, a grease hole there and the unibal goes open and then the wishbone comes back and the wheel fall off, the wheel fall off, yeah. Three corners, three corners in front of the finish line. I, I, I saw the guy with the with jacket flag, you know, and then, yeah, the rest, 
I go by feet, yeah, to the to the finish. Yeah, that was the pity thing. Otherwise, you're right, was very close to Valderol, yeah, seven, uh, eighty-seven, and uh, yeah. Otherwise, it was a good good time uh, for sure. Second, you know, maybe the win. We never know in the moment. Well, you know that is heartbreak, but you're still a legend. You're you're an absolute legend for anyone who's ever experienced even driving down a motorway or an. Autobahn and getting a flat tire, that's terrifying enough. Can you imagine doing that in this car, getting losing a wheel three turns before the end of Pike's Peak? I, yeah, I, I certainly think I might need a change of trousers after such an event. <laughs> Five meters two in length or 17 feet almost dead on. This is the IDR Volkswagen Pike's Peak. Now, it's just around about 1,100 kilos in weight, and that includes the weight of its rather well-known driver, Romain Dumas. So now for direct comparison, here is the engine bay of the IDR, and you can see just how far that technology has come on. There is not a spare cubic centimeter of space that is wasted in that design. Everything is geared towards making this car go as fast and efficiently as it possibly can. We have already had the opportunity to see this drive a little bit on the track, and it's astonishing quite how sleek this car looks when it's driving. It really doesn't do it justice to see it sitting stationary here like this, but it does allow us a chance to have a little bit of a closer look. Now, as you can see, there's an awful lot of preparation taking place behind me. The reason for that is we are very happy to tell you that we managed to qualify in first place yesterday. So the pressure is on to see what we can deliver in the finals. They're going to take place a little bit later on, and we will, of course, be able to bring that to you. But for now, it's really a treat to be able to show you this car in slightly more stripped-down format. As you can see, there is rather a lot of carbon fiber detailing on this car. The reason for that's clear. They wanted to save every single gram they were capable of saving. But there are trade-offs to be made when you're going to do that. And one of the most obvious is that some of these components are incredibly fragile. Now, yesterday, we took a little clip off one of the fairings as we went and saw how the hay bales would interact with the IDR. But don't worry, they fixed it up just fine. But as any of the drivers will be keen to tell you, it's a common mistake to make to think that these cars are exactly the same as production models in terms of their resilience. They aren't. Just have a look if Michelle can focus down at the siding on this car and see how that aerodynamic detail is held up by thin wire, pieces of wire. Now, if you put any pressure on that or stand on it, I promise you it won't stay there at all. And that is every single bit of trim on this car. So you have to be extremely gentle when you're getting in and out of it. And if you watch Roland Dumas climb out of that car, well, let's say he's in better shape than I am, and it's a good thing too. It's not an easy operation. What they're doing right now is making sure that they're minimizing the downforce as much as possible. And the reason for that is this car has been completely tuned to compete at the Pikes Peak Hill Stars. Because of the thinner air, because of the speeds, because of the altitude, that car needed to produce as much downforce as is humanly possible. And in the case of this car, that amounts to more downward pressure than the entire weight of the car itself. Well, that is one of the things that allowed it to achieve the record setting time at Pikes Peak. But at Goodwood, we don't have altitude. And to be honest, we don't have that much climbing. We only have three real corners on the course. So you don't need a whole lot of downforce for that. So what the team are trying to do right now is to actually reverse some of the aerodynamic engineering that goes into pushing that car down to make it as maneuverable as is possible. They say, come on, this is our backup car. You don't really expect us to win with it, do you? But I think they're just trying to play down our expectations. I'm pretty sure I know what they're working for, and I very much hope we'll get the chance to see it a bit later on. Well, right now, we can't get too close to the car because they're working on it so much, but you can see these wheel covers. And yesterday, Michelle was able to get a little bit closer to those. Why am I mentioning them? Well, these are very specially designed wheels. The tires themselves were produced by Michelin, and they were in joint project with this car design. It's very, very specific, the type of rubber you need for Pikes Peak. And as we were having explained to us by Roman, one of the particularly challenging things is that the weather and the humidity conditions at the bottom of the climb can not only change dramatically between there and the top, but also during the time, which means picking the right compound for the rubber is almost impossible. There's a little bit of luck involved, but also an awful lot of judgment. Now, right now you can see these covers are on the wheels, and if you're not familiar with racing, 
part of the reason for this is before the car gets on that track, it's imperative that the rubber has been warmed to the right temperature first. That saves you a lot of time. But a lot of the noise that we hear at Goodwood is because those cars are revving those tires as soon as they hit the track. They want to make sure that they're as warm as possible, nice and soft and sticky. And that really helps them keep traction while they're going on that nicely challenging hill climb. So Roman Dumas, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. I have to ask, the Dakar Rally, we have the World Rally Championship, we have four individual titles on Pikes Peak, and of course we have Le Mans 24 Hour. What's going on with you? Is normal driving just not challenging enough? <laughs> yes, it's always a challenge. But it's, uh, first of all, always a pleasure to drive. So that is, for me, the most important, to enjoy what I'm doing. To find new challenge is also very important, but, uh, you know, I still... Uh, I enjoy a lot when I'm doing Le Mans, even after 18 times. But at the end of the day, I think when you are a race car driver, you need to drive any kind of cars, any kind of challenge, like the driver were 30 years ago. Now, I feel like we learned a lot about you today, and not least of which is you like to downplay things. At the start of the day, we heard, well, it's not my first car, it's not maybe set up perfectly, and also we have a lot of downforce because of Pikes Peak, and you come in here like it's no big deal, and you beat everybody else out for qualifying. So is that, is that your strategy? Are you going to blow everyone away tomorrow? I, I hope it will continue <laughs> like that. But what I said before is for sure, uh, we can go a lot faster if we had the perfect, you know, less, we already put less downforce now, but we will improve still the car. Also myself, I can gain a lot of time, so we'll try, you know, you don't have to forget that uh, for sure this car is very, very fast. Uh, this electric power is just, uh, as you saw at the start line to the first corner, it's a kind of rocket. And uh, to drive the car is, uh, yeah, only great fun inside. So today I miss one time uh, the practice on the morning. Hopefully tomorrow <laughs> it will not miss at the end. For sure it will be possible to close for uh, a big record, but we will try, we will see. Now talking about that reduced downforce, I, I want to ask you because it's a little bit of a passion of mine. There are many years of your heart and your passion in this car. So it makes me personally very happy to see that even with all of this extraordinary technology, we still use we still use gaffer tape in order to get the effects that we want. Is this about reducing the downforce of the car? Actually, yes, you know, this we made that to close the front louver. And uh, why is that? Because we have nice louver, nice closed louver, we have that. But the problem is they're still on the thread for Pikes Peak. The car you see that was a test car, so we don't have a lot of parts. So first of all, I don't need to crash. And it's missing a lot of like the front louvers, the new bonnet that I have better visibility is not there. So uh, I, I asked FX, I said, please, can we put less downforce? So we took out the weaker on the rear, on the rear wing. So we have to close the front louver. So now we will see what we do for tomorrow, but for sure it doesn't look uh, incredible. <laughs> well, it, it does to me, and I have to say, given the amount of compromises that you've made to bring us this drive today, it's, it's nothing short of amazing, and I can't wait to see what you're going to be doing with it tomorrow. I'm really keen to ask, you've obviously had the opportunity to work with this technology for a long time now, and the very name of the car itself, the IDR, suggest to us that we're going to start seeing some of this technology, some of these ideas coming through to the regular lineup. Obviously, a racing car is such a specialized thing, but can you see anything of the future in driving this car? Well, for sure that, anyway, at the end of the day, now motorsport changed a lot the last, I would say, 15 years. You know, if you see all the cars you can see there, I would say 15 years ago, any brand were doing Le Mans race or other race because they want to win the race and they are passionate. I think now a brand is still passionate by success, definitely. But any brands who are doing motorsport, I mean on a Volkswagen Group, from Porsche to Audi on a time to even here, what we learn on a, on a race car will be one day on a road car, for sure. It's easy to understand how you will ask budget if one day we'll be not on a road car. That will be stupid. So for sure, what we are learning now one day, hopefully will be on a, <laughs> on, a, on a Volkswagen car on the road, yes. So, obviously, you came here today with a rather special ride, but one of the nice things about Goodwood is there is more or less every single car you can imagine here, and I have to ask, is there anything that you've seen that piques your interest, you haven't had the chance to drive, and you think, you know what, I wouldn't mind taking that out for a little spin? Well, for sure, the only problem is 
I am so passionate by uh, motorsport. You know, when uh, you drove the rally, the Dakar and whatever, hill climb, Le Mans. I had a lot of cars at home for rally because my first uh, passion was rally. So from an old M330, not only Porsche, I have a lot of Porsche, as you all know. But uh, when I came yesterday, the first car I, I was looking for was a Lancia S4. Uh, that I think was a terrific car. When I saw it yesterday, they opened the door that I can look inside. I went with FX de Maison to look the car. I said, look at that. <laughs> so for me, it was very impressive. But a lot of cars also were for me. Uh, you know, if you look the BMW one Le Mans also, uh, at the end of the, on the 2000, early 2000, was also an incredible car. This morning, I saw also the Mercedes in Le Mans. I only saw this, uh, this car on TV. And when it was flipping, the first time when I went to see the car, Inside, I saw a huge steering wheel like a bus. I was surprised, but it's good because all these cars, they have a really incredible good points. Some because they are, you know, old, old. They have some strange points, like uh, just I just mentioned. But they always have something interesting. If you look, the Lancia S4 is full of Kevlar. So car, everything is in Kevlar, and uh, you are you are thinking, but how they made that on a, on a time, you know? And uh, if yeah, it's, it's quite fun for that to see the technology, how they move different between different brands also and what they were focused on and not also. Well, we were lucky enough to have a chat earlier on to Yoki and see the Mark II Golf. And it really is extraordinary to see how the technology has come on. And I couldn't resist but ask him if he fancied having a little drive around in this. And he got a little bit misty eyed. I have to say it would be more than a pleasure to see you both have a chance to swap rides and see how you got on. Thank you so much for the time you spent with us. You must be more than ready to have a little bit of relaxing now and preparing for tomorrow. And we can't wait to see what you're going to do. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully we continue like that to gain some uh, tenths of second or a little more. We will see. Thank you so much. Speak to absolutely anyone on the IDR team and they will tell you that this man knows everything there is to know about this car. So I like that look of terror. So for the benefit of our viewers, please tell us who you are and what you do with the team. Well, I'm FX de Maison. I'm the technical director at Volkswagen Motorsport. So I'm in some way the, the father of this car. He gave that answer very humbly for somebody with possibly one of the most exciting jobs in motorsport. So you have spent an incredible amount of time, effort and energy building this. And congratulations, by the way, on your achievements. Please explain it to us. Well, first, thank you for the, the, the I mean, it was a great, uh, a great achievement for the team. So I take it for the team. It's uh, yeah, it was a great, great pleasure. But but the car, yeah, is the f I mean, it's, uh, let's say, the first uh, double engine uh, our double motor uh, race car we, we can find. I mean, it's, uh, it's a quite powerful car, uh, but uh, the, the, the big thing, I mean, we really work hard to, to make it as light as possible. And, uh, because the weight of the normally electric car, uh, car is, is quite high because the battery technology is, is, is moving, for sure. I mean, uh, every month you see new, uh, new cells coming. And uh, from where we started this, uh, this concept to now, there are already uh, more, I mean, higher energy density cells available. So the, the, the main effort was to really uh, drop the weight as low as possible and, and the aero, because this is, uh, this is free weight. This is weight you have to push, to push on the wheel, but uh, it costs you no, no real energy. You know? Well, speaking with Yoki earlier on, I'm starting to get the sense that the racing division Volkswagen, in any case, very much like the two-engine configuration. I, I have to say, does that mean we're going to have a dual fuel cell come out next? <laughs> where, where could this lead to? But there are a lot of technological advances on this car as it relates to how we think about electric vehicles in general. Are there any specific features here that you think will become part of the lineup as we go forwards? Well, this concept of, of two motors, as you say, is, uh, is an is this I mean history in, in Volkswagen because Pike Speak and the jockey try to to beat the, the record there with a double uh, or twin engine uh, Golf. But I think I mean it's uh, it's a good way to to put as much uh, let's say torque on the on the ground or power under the ground with uh, with a four wheel drive. So this two uh, two motor concept is uh, I mean to make a, let's say a powerful car or a fast car. It's uh, it's a must. Yeah. So now you achieved the fastest qualifying time today. And given that you've only just come from Colorado, you have limited spare parts, this is not your first choice car, I think that's an extraordinary achievement. But this is really what I want to talk to you about. Now, for my benefit and my sanity, 
this is a very high-tech car. Yes. Please tell me this isn't standard gaffer tape. Like, what, what, what am I looking at here? No, but I mean, it, it, we tried to adjust the, the aero balance, and uh, that was a last-minute uh, decision because we, we, we wanted to really limit the drag, so we removed some of the rear wing, and then we said, oh, yeah, but the balance will be affected, so we have to, to, limit the, uh, to reduce the front downforce. So the, only, the quickest way to do it is to close the, the louver. So... Well, I, I know we have literally thousands and thousands of euros worth of pressed carbon fiber and very high technology components here. I'm just desperate to know, is this some special racing tape that normal people can't get hold of or is this just the same gaffer tape that I have in my garage? It's a normal tongue tape that everybody has at home and uh, I mean, you can do miracle with tongue tape. I think we went, oh, some people went to, uh, to the moon with tongue tape, so you can do a lot with a, a bloody uh, tongue tape. That is the technical director of Volkswagen Racing telling you that go ahead, gaffer tape is something you need in your toolbox. I absolutely love that. Now, obviously, every single gram on this car has been looked at, looked at again. Is there anything really special that's taken place within the cockpit from a standard car to keep that weight down? Well, unfortunately not. I don't think we have any uh, any part from the apart from the Volkswagen sticker, but uh, most of the parts are really lightweight uh, aerospace or special made parts for for this car. So, but I, I guess what I'm asking is, did we evolve with this car one step further from the racing technology we already had? Are there uh, new ideas being put to use within the cockpit here that we don't already know from previous racing cars? I mean, uh, for sure, we we developed new. Uh, I mean, new battery, new battery uh, management system. The the, the the motor are the top. I mean, state of the art of uh, what is will be available for Formula E in the future. So we just push the limit on any single component and uh, and try, as I say, to build the, the lightest and the most powerful uh, uh, race car for Pikes Peak. Roman was telling us earlier that in terms of the driver's experience of this car, because it is fully electric, the information that's available to the driver is really quite special and different from what you might come to expect from a, a, a petrol, a standard petrol racing experience. Yeah, I mean, for I mean, a powerful or a race electric car, a racing electric car, the, the, the main thing is to, to keep the battery in, the, in its optimum range, of mostly of temperature and voltage. So the, the most useful information for, for Romain are the battery uh, states. I mean, char state of charge, temperature, uh, voltage, minimum, maximum. So that's the most, the, let's say, the, the, the technical information he had on the, uh, on the steering wheel or on the, on, the, on the display. And then it's a few safety things like uh, the, the tire pressure, because if you have a, a low pressure tire, it can be, a, with this car, it can be a big disaster. Now, I read that, especially for the Pikes Peak Challenge, because that's such a challenging environment, the downforce that this car can produce is actually greater than the overall weight of the car, which is quite an extraordinary achievement. Was there something that you really managed to achieve with this that you hadn't maybe before thought was possible in order to get that effect? I mean, when we, we started the, the project, we fixed some target to the to, uh, to aero de our aero department in terms of downforce and, uh, and drag. But uh, I, I never expected to get so, uh, so high numbers. So I had to adjust a few times uh, <laughs> the target because they reached the target too quickly. And uh, uh, we even had uh, to uh, limit the, the speed on the wind tunnel because the, the, the underfloor was so powerful that the belt was just lifting up. So we, we had to limit uh, <laughs> really the, the wind speed. That really is remarkable. Well, I think, I think folks, if I have to sum up, what we've learned here today is technology's great, gaffer tape. That's what it's all about. That's how we achieve our goals, gaffer tape. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us and congratulations again on an extraordinary achievement. And I'm sure you're as excited as we are to get to tomorrow and see, can we claim the overall victory? What do you think? Ah, the victory, I think we, we want to, to get it, but um, yeah, we, we do our best for tomorrow. And the, the race is really tomorrow. Today is just practice and uh, tomorrow is a big day. Excellent. Well, we'll look forward to that. And uh, if today was just practice, I can't wait to see what comes tomorrow.
There are cars from every single generation at this event. And if you talk to any one of the teams, the one thing that they will tell you, I'm sure you know already, is that racing is not cheap. Being at this festival is not a cheap undertaking. But when you see some of the cars and you speak to some of the owners, they'll tell you they just have to be here because there really is no point in being responsible for a car like that unless you're going to be able to take it out and show everyone just what it's capable of doing. Mm. We're here at the McLaren stand at Goodwood and here the news is all about the brand new 600 LT. LT short for long tail and it's the first one of those we've seen in quite some time. Now because they're playing loud music on the stand we can't get any closer than this with the audio. Obviously we have rights issues if we do that but don't worry Michelle's going to get up close and take a bit of a better look for you and I'll tell you some details about what we're looking at. Do you have a spare £185,000? Well, then maybe you might want to think about the brand new 600 LT. This thing, unbelievably, is only the fourth McLaren in over two decades to receive the LT. Obviously, that's short for long tail, and it is the first ever sports series to feature it. It is really quite something special. Producing 600, or just shy of 600 horsepower, it also features a 3.8 litre twin turbocharged McLaren V8 engine. Top speed of 204 miles per hour. Not quite sure what that would be in new money. I think 320 around about that kilometers per hour. And it is absolutely stunning. Are we gonna get to give it a go, Michelle? I don't know, what do you think? Goodwood isn't just about classic cars, of course. We also have more than a few rather nice brand new supercars. And the Lamborghini stand seems like as good a place as any to tell you about those. Well, this of course is the Huracan, but the big news at Lamborghini is the coming electrification of the lineup. We are going to have a V12 hybrid Aventador. I can't wait to get my hands on that, but until we have the opportunity, let's have a look over here. Well, this is the Urus. It's not exactly new news now. It's been on the market for quite some time, but I will say this is the first time at the car park here that I've actually seen customers driving this thing. And I'm very pleased to be able to tell you that the feedback is all good. Clearly, to take a big step into the SUV market is going to be a risk for any supercar manufacturer. But the initial feedback the Lamborghini have had around this model in particular is really, really positive. The styling is still very much distinctively Lamborghini. The base, still the same as a Q7, but I'm gonna say if you have driven the Q7 and then you try the Urus, you're gonna find the ride experience is just a little bit different. Why not take it out for a spin? Goodwood has such a high profile as an event. It is the only event, as far as I'm aware of, outside of Formula One where you have all of the race teams represented. I'm really a big fan of the Mercedes stand because why just bring one car when you can bring four? So we have everything here, 2017, 2016, 15 and 14. One of the most impressive things to be able to see about these cars in the flesh is just how much the fine tuning changes from season to season. You really start getting a sense of exactly why this is such an expensive sport. It's not only that every single year you make little improvements, but every single year the regulations change, sometimes just a little, sometimes enormously. And the pressure that puts upon the engineers to get the car design right, not only for the drive, but also for the driver, is enormous. And I think if you feel the way I do, the results are just stunning. Of course, you can tell that best when you see the cars actually racing. We won't be able to do that today, but it's really nice to be able to get up close and personal with them. What you're looking at right now is a 1936 Auto Union Type C. And what I love about this team is they've really entered into the spirit here at Goodwood. Look at those shirts, braces and bow ties. These guys aren't messing around. More importantly, look at that engine. That is absolutely beautiful. You can see cars of all ages, all types, and all flavors here at Goodwood. But I have to say, my heart definitely belongs with the older stuff. Just look at this thing. And what's absolutely wonderful to look at is how beautifully preserved this is. Every single nut, bolt, and screw on this thing is polished with an inch of its life. And the guys are working really hard right now to make sure that once it gets on the hill, it's every bit as exciting to watch as it is to look at right now. I think we're just about all set now, Michelle. I think, is this a, a, a record for the Alto Gafool team meeting? I think it is, isn't it? What time is Thomas arriving?
from us here at Goodwood for 2018. What an event it's been. There's so many cars. It's really very difficult to imagine how there could be a car that you like or love that isn't here to be seen. And if you're very lucky, you get to watch race. Well, the reason that we came here was to watch the IDR perform. And what a fantastic experience that's been. Given the amount of compromises that they had to make even in order just to bring the car here, I think the performance and the drive has been spectacular. We've had so much fun taking the opportunity to watch the whole team hard at work, and we hope you have too. Please don't forget, if you have any comments or questions, pop them below. Meanwhile, please subscribe, and we hope we'll see you again soon.